Welcome, everyone. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, uh, I'm uh, Dr. Mark Kondos. I'm one of the co-directors of the Sir Michael Howard Center and the, the convener of this, this seminar series. Uh, and I'm very happy to introduce um, this evening our, our speaker, um, Professor David Lambert um, from the University of uh, Warwick. Um, Professor Lambert is a professor of Caribbean history at the University of Warwick, um, and his research explores um, histories of slavery and empire in the 18th and 19th centuries. Uh, with a particular focus on the Caribbean. Um, he's the author of uh, White Creole, Culture, Politics and Identity During the Age of Abolition, uh, Mastering the Niger, James McQueen's African Geography and the Struggle Over Atlantic Slavery, uh, and is uh, more recently a co-editor of Empire and Mobility in the Long 19th Century. Um, he's currently the principal investigator on a new AHRC funded project that looks at the history of West India regiments from the late 19th to early 20th centuries, um, and uh, as I understand, is in sort of the final stages of uh, preparing a book um, on this. And uh, I believe that's what he's going to be uh, talking to with us about this evening. So without further ado, please, David, take it away. Okay. Thanks, Mark. And um, thank you uh, um, for those of you who joined us. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I'm just going to, um, I'm, I'm going to present a specific element of the book, which is essentially on the kind of um, the changing image, changing the status of the West India regiments across the long 19th century. Um, I am going to touch on some of the other things, and if people would like to talk more about some of the earlier histories um, uh, and the West India regiments more broadly, then obviously I'm very happy to do so. Okay, so um, in 1898, the year after Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee, the graphic illustrated newspaper published a free four page supplement entitled Our Colonial Troops, which included um, this color print of a crowd of 89 military figures accompanied by a numbered legend to aid with their identification. The print quotes from the final stanza of a poem by Alfred Lord Tennyson, one with Britain, heart and soul, one life, one flag, one throne. And uh, Tennyson had written this poem um, at the, when he was the Poet Laureate at the request of the Prince of Wales, and he read it at the opening of the Indian and Colonial, uh, the Colonial and Indian Exhibition, which had taken place in London in 1886. And the poem cast the relationship between Britain and its empire in familial terms. And the graphic takes this to uh, underscore its image of a multi-ethnic, cross-cultural martial fraternity. The print also evokes both contemporary practices of the display of racialized types, which of course were very much associated with exhibitions like that in 1886, and also a culture of imperial military spectacle that was particularly intense around Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. And the Diamond Jubilee had taken place the year before in 1897, when real representatives of many of these military units had paraded through the streets of London. The graphics full color print was accompanied by an article by Percy, uh, John Percy Groves, who was a Lieutenant Colonel in the Royal Guernsey Artillery. And in addition to his military service, Groves is well known as the author of military histories and also military themed adventure stories, particularly aimed at, uh, at boys. His article, which was entitled Defenders of the Empire, sketched out the composition of Britain's global military forces at the end of the 19th century. So Groves talks about the Indian army, and then he goes on to make a distinction between, on the one hand, British imperial troops that were recruited in Britain itself, in the metropole, and on the other hand, what he called purely colonial forces. And the latter consisted primarily of locally raised permanent units, militia, volunteers, and armed police that provided the defense forces across the self-governing colonies of Canada, Australia, South Africa, and New Zealand. And these had seen the gradual withdrawal of imperial forces since 1870. Most other colonies and dependencies across the empire were still garrisoned by forces sent out from Britain. So in addition, however, to these three categories of Indian, the Indian army, purely colonial forces and British imperial troops, there also existed um, another category that Grove somewhat awkwardly termed imperial colonial corps. And these were imperial units that were not recruited in Britain, but could not be deemed purely colonial forces either. And this was a real kind of mixed bag of units. So along with the uh, West India Regiment, which I'm gonna be focusing on, uh, the, there was also the Hong Kong Regiment, uh, which was the only other existing unit of uh, what Groves called local imperial infantry, 
Uh, and this was a relatively recent unit. It had been formed only in 1891, and raised essentially as a battalion of native infantry in India, in, in the Indian Army. And then this unit was seconded uh, to the British Army for service in Hong Kong. Another of these Imperial Colonial Corps was the Royal Malta Artillery, which, like the West India Regiment and various other artillery and engineer units, was also a regular part of the British Army. It had its origins in infantry units that had been raised in the early 19th century, but had then been converted into an artillery unit in 1861. There were also other units that were categorised as Imperial Colonial Corps, but they were quite different. They were mainly various armed police forces raised in places like um, West Africa. Now, the graphics depiction of this Imperial Military Brotherhood, uh, this, our, our colonial troops, obscured as much as it revealed, I would argue. It represented a range of types of military units that performed different roles, that were made up of men of different ethnicities and religions, some that were part of the British Army, others that were not. And the only thing that they had in common was that their rank and file were raised across the British Empire, including India, rather than in Britain itself. And one of the effects of lumping all these units together was to eject the West India Regiment figuratively from the British Army and instead to place it amongst the company of our colonial troops. It was not unique in this exclusion, but the West India Regiment was the oldest of this rather cumbersomely entitled Imperial Colonial Corps, perhaps one of the reasons why it sits so central in the image. It should also be recognised that while placing the West India Regiment representative in this diverse company would at first sight seem to be an act of colour blindness, a sense that's reinforced by the familial sentiment of Tennyson's poem, the simultaneous effect was to render the British Army, the rest of the British Army, who of course do not appear in this image, as white and metropolitan, in whose company African Caribbean soldiers do not really belong. Now the issue of where and how the West India Regiments fitted in within Britain's global military forces was a long-standing one. In the same year that the graphic published this coloured print, the 3rd Battalion of the West India Regiment was passing through Portsmouth, on its way to garrison the island of St Helena in the South Atlantic. The Navy and Illustrated uh, newspaper expressed its regret that the, its visit to Britain was such a short one and it, it expressed its wish that a larger public would have been able to see a complete battalion of this quote most picturesque and serviceable corps. Responding to its readers presumed lack of understanding about the nature of the West India Regiment the newspaper explained that it was nothing more than an ordinary line infantry regiment, albeit one composed as to rank and file of coloured men. And of course, that its status required such qualification confirms the general public ignorance, despite the efforts of uh, military insiders and more specialist military publications. So what I want to do in this paper then is to um, consider how, in a sense, the West India Regiment ends up in this company uh, amongst the co colonial troops by the end of the 19th century, rather than symbolically appearing alongside uh, other units in the regular British Army. And it does so by examining the contested and the uncertain place of the West India Regiment within overlapping cultures of militarism and popular imperialism that characterised late 19th century Britain. And I'm, I'm interested in the kind of the way in which the West India Regiment were written about, the way in which they were depicted visually, but also about their physical participation in embodied events in this period. The 1890s represented the period in which the regiment came to the greatest prominence in British culture. So the image on the left is from the Army and Navy Gazette, very famous series of types of the British Army, which many, many images of the kind of British Army from this period come from this, this series that was published over years. This is the one um, uh, when the, the, the issue when the West India Regiment are featured. The image on the right is a, a doll of the West India Regiment. Um, it, so just the examples of kind of the way in which uh, the West India Regiment do feature within the kind of material culture and visual culture um, of the late 19th century. Moreover, by virtue, by virtue of the role of the West India Regiment in a series of campaigns in West Africa, uh, they also featured in the in newspapers and the illustrated press. So people were writing about them, people were talking about them, people were depicting them. Small detachments also participated in the Royal Military Tournament in 1896 and in the Diamond Jubilee a year later. But 
despite the coverage they received, including the well-publicized presence of Sergeant William Gordon, who was the only the second African Caribbean man to win the Victoria Cross. Such prominence did not mean, did not equate with an understanding of their place and history within the British Army. Instead, the West India Regiment was often marginalized, lumped in with native troops on the basis of the ethnicity of their rank and file. In short, even as they were brought home, the men of the West India Regiment were rendered somewhat exotic and strange, their century as part of the British Army occluded. Okay, so what I'm going to do then, I'll start by briefly explaining, like for those of the people who know nothing about the West India Regiment, there's no reason why people should. I'll give you a little bit about the history. Um, and again, I'm very happy to say more about this if people wish. So um, after Britain went to uh, war with revolutionary France in February uh, 1793, the Caribbean became a very significant theatre of conflict as it had been throughout much of the 18th century. Initially, things went well for the British. Um, the, their forces captured parts of Saint-Domingue, what's now Haiti, and captured Tobago a year later. Uh, Martinique, St. Lucia, Guadeloupe were all seized in 1794, but the military balance began to shift against the British in, from February 90, 1794, after the National Convention in Paris formally ended colonial slavery in the French colonies. And this left Britain as the primary defenders of slavery in the region. The arrival of Victor Hugo and other Jacobin commissioners stiffened French resistance across the French islands and their agents sought to promote unrest and resistance amongst French speaking free non-white and enslaved populations in places like Dominica and Grenada, as well as amongst the so-called Black Caribs of St. Vincent. Facing conventional and irregular warfare, British forces were driven out of Guadeloupe by the end of 1794 and from St. Lucia the following summer. That same year, 1795, there were also serious revolts in the British colonies of Grenada and St. Vincent, as well as the Trelawney Town Maroons uprising in Jamaica. But it was in France's key colony, the most valuable colony of all, saint man that things really turned most against the British. A small expeditionary force of 2,000 troops had landed uh, there uh, from Jamaica in the autumn of 1793 and occupied key ports. But in 1794, Britain's military situation was transformed from an expedition against French Republicans into an all-out war against the coalition of black commanders led by Toussaint Louverture. Overall, the British committed almost 25,000 troops to Saint-Domingue, of, of whom two-thirds died there. Opposed by Louverture's forces and suffering further losses from disease, the situation in Sandaman deteriorated into what's been described as one of the most tragic episodes in British military history and a crushing blow to British national pride. The British withdrew in 1798 and evacuated their remaining forces. Now, crucially, the, the setbacks that, the, that Britain faced across the Caribbean in this period provided the impetus for the authorization and establishment of the first West India regiments from 1795. Um, this is a wonderful image. This came on the market a few years ago. It's those of you people may know. This is now um, was purchased by and, and displayed by the National Army Museum, and uh, a really really striking um, image, um, and and one that just reiterates that these were these, the West India regiments formed part of the regular British Army. These are not colonial auxiliaries or anything like that. Um, they were. Um, trained, they were uh, uniformed, they were armed, they were paid, they were rationed along the same basis as regular uh, regiments of foot. Consolidating some existing units, including African Americans who'd fought for the British in the American Revolutionary War, their numbers were greatly augmented through the conscription of enslaved African men purchased directly from slave traders. Uh, and indeed, in the late 1790s and early 1800s, the British government purchased more than 13,000 enslaved Africans for the regiments, making the British uh, state the largest uh, individual purchaser of, ens of enslaved people in this period, um, at a cost of almost a million pounds sterling. After slavery was formally ended in the British Empire in the 1830s, the regiments became more African-Caribbean in character, recruited within the region, although there were still enrollments in West Africa. Their officers were white and British until right at the end of the 19th century where you begin to see some evidence of non-white officers. During their existence of more than 130 years, West India Regiment soldiers served across the Caribbean, including in the continental enclaves of um, what were British Honduras and British Guyana, 
and also participated in the War of 1812. From the 1820s, they were also deployed at Sierra Leone, the Gambia, the Gold Coast, Lagos, and elsewhere in West Africa. Numbering 12 regiments at their peak of a single battalion each, uh, a single regiment comprising two battalions was all that remained after 1888, and then briefly a third battalion was created, um, uh, but uh, disbanded. The final regiment was disbanded in 1927. Throughout this history, this long history, the martial capabilities, the martial capacities of the West India regiments was constantly questioned. At the most extreme, we see this right at the beginning of their history, when we see um, a serious dispute and conflict between, on the one hand, British military authorities in the region who are desperate for soldiers, and then white West Indian colonists in places like Jamaica, for whom the idea of arming me African men is seen as a, not, not a, a military boon, but actually a, a th an existential threat to the system of racial slavery on which they rely. Although such sentiment did recede, even decades later, there were many, including very senior uh, military figures, as I'll explain, who continue to express skepticism uh, and, and doubts about the military value of, West in, of the West India regiments. And, and fundamentally, a lot of this turned on basically on, on thinking around race. So um, there, was, there were ideas that um, they were either kind of too cow, cow, uh, childlike and cowardly to be soldiers on the one hand, or else they were too savage and brutish to be soldiers on the other hand. So you know, the kind of certain understandings of kind of um, Africanness within the kind of European imagination in the, in the 19th century. And all of this formed part of a, of, a, of a debate about the status of the West India regiments and about how they fitted in or didn't fit in within Britain's imperial military forces. And by the late 19th century, as I'll, I'll show in this paper, this is now playing out in a kind of a public stage and in the realm of um, the kind of militarized mass culture that characterizes characterizes late Victorian Britain. Now, despite their longevity and place within the British Army, the West India regiments were relatively little known in Britain itself for much of the 19th century. This is because, as I said, they served primarily in the Caribbean and West Africa, although some detachments were sent to Britain for specialist weapons training. Their most significant military role in the second half of the 19th century, which did have an effect on how well they were known, was during the Anglo-Ashanti War of 1873-74. Um, I'm not going to say much about this. The conflict basically begins when an Ashanti army attacks and defeats local um, British allies, Fanti allies, uh, inland of what the British call the Gold Coast, uh, and, begin, and, and essentially challenge Britain's commercial dominance in that part of what's now southern Ga um, uh, Ghana. The British eventually respond by dispatching an expeditionary force under the command of Garnet Joseph Wosley, uh, which drove the Ashanti army back, and West India Regiment forces participate um, in the war, in, the, for, for, in the, the, the conflict for more than eight months, even before Wosley arrives and before the reinforcements arrive. But when um, the British forces uh, enter the Ashanti capital of Kumasi at the climax of the campaign, the West India soldiers are not allowed to enter the Ashanti capital. Wosley does not permit the West India Regiment men to go into the Ashanti capital. Now, the, this, the conflict of 1873-74 is an interesting one in lots of ways, and I can say more about it if people wish. It's Britain's first significant military expedition into the tropical African interior. It's also the first uh, British colonial campaign that really catches the public imagination and in some ways sets the, um, the store for the kind of later uh, interest in within po British popular culture in kind of imperial warfare, imperial affairs, which kind of tied up with the scramble for Africa later on. Um, the expedition is accompanied by a number of special correspondents, newspaper correspondents, who go on to produce published accounts of the war, as do a number of Wosley's hand-picked staff officers, many of whom would also form part of the influential Ashanti or Wosley ring. Now, even though locally based West India Regiment forces had played an important part in the first half of the campaign, they were pushed aside by Wosley, converted to baggage handlers for white troops, not permitted to enter Kumasi, as I said, and were rather marginalised in published accounts. And as such, the war was kind of assimilated into what Bruce Vandervoort terms the myth of the all-conquering Western way of war, by which small numbers of white soldiers were able to defeat vastly more numerous non-white warriors, usually through kind of superior tactics and weaponry. Um, 
In fact, this conflict and indeed the later scramble for Africa saw European powers rely on indigenous armies using cast off firearms, sometimes with the support of imperial forces like the West India regiments. So whilst this first kind of colonial media war may have made a household name and military hero of Wosley, and was an important moment in the awakening of the militarized mass culture that characterized Britain in the final decades of the century, it did little for the reputation of the West India regiments themselves who'd been involved from the start. Now, the idea that West India regiments could not be relied upon, and this was kind of Wosley's view, and again, I can say a little bit about, if people wish more about the origins of that. Uh, there were people who sought to kind of push back against this. So the final two decades of the 19th century saw the publication of the first book length histories of the West India regiments. Um, Alfred Bird and Ellis's History of the First and James Caulfield's History of the Second. Um, and both were by former or current senior officers with a long-standing association with the regiments. And interestingly, both had also, uh, both men, Ellis and Caulfield, had been junior officers during the Anglo-Ashanti War. And both wrote about the kind of dismay that they had felt when um, West India Regiment forces were not allowed to enter Kumasi. And, and, and Ellis actually describes it as a deliberate slight on the regiments. In response, uh, they sought to put the record straight. So Ellis, for example, um, provides a kind of comprehensive historical account of the West India Regiment's operations, including the battle honours they'd received for their actions in the Caribbean, and later in West Africa. And he also sketches out the history of some of the other regiments. And essentially was trying to sort of stress how valuable they were, how important they were. He also sought to take on some of the negative views of the West India regiments, particularly those he associated with Wosley and some of his supporters. Um, so one of the criticisms of the West India regiments, which Wosley would, would write about um, in, a, in, in an article, was, about, was to do with the kind of relationship between the changing um, demographic makeup of the regiments and how that impacted on their martial capacity. So Wosley argued essentially that when in the early years of the regiments they were mainly made up of Africans who could fight well in close combat. They were savage, they were naturally savage and, and were good in close combat. As over time they became more African Caribbean, in other words they were recruited from, in Jamaica or Barbados or Antigua and as, as was understood at the time they became more civilized um, they lost that kind of natural savagery, but didn't make up for it by becoming better at fighting, at, at firing uh, uh, rifles. So, you know, this was a kind of argument that, that Wosley made. And um, Ellis sought to try and tackle this very directly. And one, one of the ways he does this is with this is one of the two images that appear in the book. Now, this is a very unremarkable image. It just shows some soldiers standing, um, you know, firing a, a practicing marksmanship. But actually, if you look at the visual archive, of the West India regiments. If you look at images of them, they are very, 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 very rarely ever actually shown firing guns. Most images of the West India regiment look like that. Whatever uniform they're wearing, whatever style of uniform they're wearing, normally they're just standing around almost as if like, you know, in the middle of a drill or as if they're being kind of um, inspected. So this image and the argument that Ellis builds around it, that they were in fact steady, reliable marksmen was, uh, was actually striking and how unusual it was. So what we see then here is a kind of a, another instance of um, this kind of debate around the West India regiments regarding their military value and professionalism, which we can trace back to the very origins, as I mentioned before, and, some, and it also remained a feature of the coverage of the regiments in the late 19th century. So they're involved in a series of campaigns in West Africa in this period, and um, we see again they kind of they you know they, there's a lot of coverage of them they you know, their public profile is raised but we see these kind of two contrasting images of the regiments so um we can sort of again i'll contrast them visually so on the one hand we have an image like this which was produced by um haldane mcfall who was a junior officer in the west one of the west um in the remaining west india regiment who produced images for the graphic newspaper and this is again an unusual image because it shows the West India regiments firing actually in combat, which is uh, is not the usual case. And it's a very you know it's a, it's a, it's a, an image of soldiers fighting. Um, but this is much more typical. This is an image uh, from Henry Charles Seppings Wright, um, who was the special artist for the Illustrated London News, who was also on the in the field with the West India regiments, but wasn't wasn't an officer. He was an outsider. And his images tended to show the West India regiments in kind of either just sort of passively standing around or in these kind of like semi-comical 
uh, sort of uh, scenes. And, you know, we don't think we don't need to scratch the surface too far here to sort of we can think about kind of the, the, the kind of racist the comic traditions of the period, kind of minstrelsy and ideas about blackface and the figure of the coon and so on. There's, it's it's not overt, but there is essentially this is these are not professional soldiers. This there's a use um, the immaterial is of of, of, of humour uh, rather than of professionalism. And that contrast between this kind of image and this kind of image, I think, characterises this this debate, this uncertainty about um, their value and, and, and how the relationship between the kind of inside of you and the outside of you. Now, one of the problems that Ellis identified in his history of the first West India Regiment was that West India Regiments were never seen in England and as a result the British public knew nothing about them. Now that's not strictly true. As I mentioned before, African Caribbean soldiers did come um, in small numbers to, to do weapons training. More also, uh, moreover, the, the regimental band performed at the Colonial Indian Exhibition of 1886, where um, Alfred Lord Tennyson had read that poem, um, and the coverage at the time noted with approval that they were, quote, all Christians and spoke uh, English. And again, the, the fact that that needed to be stated, that the surprise that they were, in fact, good speakers of English and Christians, again, speaks to the kind of ignorance about their composition and history. A decade later, a detachment of West India Regiment soldiers featured in the Royal Military Tournament. This had been inaugurated in 1880 and ran for a fortnight during the, the London season and took place at the Royal Agricultural Hall in Islington. Um, it consisted of two daily performances of competitions and displays, and from 1895, historical parades were added as a new feature. In 1896, a new event was added, which was the Sons of the Empire Pageant which featured representatives of British regiments, as well as others typical of our Indian and colonial regulars, volunteers and militia. Reflecting the militarised mass culture that was an important element of late Victorian Britain, the, press, uh, the, the newspaper coverage had little doubt that this element would be the most popular with the British public. And one of the kind of sentiments that's commonly uh, expressed in coverage of this event is that it provides, quote, the most valuable object lesson on the greatness of the British Empire. So that the the kind of the display of, of, of soldiers themselves becomes like almost like um, a, a way of mapping out how much of the world is pink. Now the arrangements for the Sons of Empire pageants had been made by Lieutenant Colonel Edward Ward. Um, his service in Sudan and Ireland in the 1880s and 1890s had brought him to Wosley's attention and was chosen by Wosley to serve during the Anglo-Ashanti War of 1895-96, which was the final war that Britain and the Kingdom of Ashanti fought, which West Indian Regiment uh, soldiers participated in. Um, and he would, def would go on to, form, um, to, to serve as the Deputy Assistant Adjutant General in the Home District Staff uh, in London. In organising the pageant, he divided it into six sections, symbolising the armed forces of Britain, India, Canada, South Africa, Australia, and finally, a collection of other colonies. In turn, each section comprised the four individuals drawn from different units on parade. In the case of the sixth section, this was headed by representatives of the, of the white volunteer Trinidad Yeomanry Cavalry, and then behind them, um, indicated by this arrow, followed on, on foot, were the West India Regiment, uh, as well as various forces uh, from West Africa, the Jamaican militia, uh, um, the Hong Kong Regiment and the British Guyana Police. So what we see then here is a, an imperial logic coming to the fore rather than a military one, which served to place non-white elements of the British Army, including the West India Regiment, in the final section of the pageant, which was often referred to as the colonial forces. So they're, they're separated from their, the rest of the British Army at the back. Interestingly, the parading soldiers of the West India Regiment were often singled out, um, and we get this, this is a coverage from the relatively recently founded Daily Mail, um, which turned on, um, described the, the kind of the, uh, uh, the, the swagger of the West India Regiment soldiers, and uh, the, the trope of teeth and eyes glistening, of course, is a, you know, is a, um, a patronising and basically, a frankly, it's, a, it's kind of part of a kind of a, a racist way of thinking about people of African descent, which is common in this period. Um, and this alongside rather dismissive accounts of their supposedly showy Zawav uniform, which again, I can talk about if you wish to discuss that uniform. Um, this was a manifestation of the marginalization of the West India regiments in late Victorian popular culture. And indeed, despite the, a lot of the kind of rather lofty rhetoric 
around the pageant that it portrayed, it was kind of a symbol of military fraternity. Um, it was actually an imperial and to a lesser extent racial logic that was to the fore. And this went beyond just casting the West India Regiment towards the rear of the procession. Only a few weeks after the military tournament, it was reported that the British Army was considering a plan to bring each West India Regiment battalion to Aldershot for periods of training. The proposal was uh, widely, widely criticised in the British press. It was noted that while it was perfectly normal for white British soldiers to serve alongside non-white British soldiers in the empire, as they'd done most recently during the Anglo-Ashanti War of 1895-96, the idea of stationing large numbers of non-white soldiers in Britain alongside white British soldiers was seen as unprecedented and it was stated that this would not be popular amongst white British soldiers and the plan was never enacted. So whether on show or in training, the men of the West India regiments found themselves pushed to the rear, their place as part of the regular British army compromised by the imperial and racial logics that were coming to the fore in this period. A year after participating in the first Sons of the Empire pageant, detachments from both the 1st and 2nd battalions of West India Regiment travelled to Britain again for an even more significant public event, and this was Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee. There'd been little public uh, political enthusiasm for the 1887 Golden Jubilee, but that of a decade later was transformed by the um, Conservative and Union government, and especially by uh, Joseph Chamberlain, who was the colonial secretary, into a true celebration of empire. All 11 prime ministers of Britain's self-governing colonies were invited, uh, along with contingents of soldiers from India uh, uh, and the rest of the empire. The visiting premiers were treated like royal foreign dignitaries, and there was a real effort by Chamberlain to impress them with the display of metropolitan wealth and power. And Chamberlain's hope was that this would, um, they, that he would be able to obtain mutually beneficial agreements on commerce and imperial defence. So as such, empire took on centre stage at the Diamond Jubilee. And this moment has often been regarded as like the definitive expression of the ideological uh, dimensions of British imperialism. And it was also accompanied by um, what's, what historians have described as a, a, a sense of kind of British race sense, sentiment or Britannic nationalism, which is at its peak uh, at this period. The Diamond Jubilee itself was celebrated between the 19th and 24th of June with a range of ceremonial festivities, displays, speeches and official uh, processions in London, as well as across Britain and the rest of the empire. The unimaginative but flamboyant heart, as it's been described, of the event was a six mile procession on the 22nd of June from Buckingham Palace for a Thanksgiving service at St Paul's Cathedral. Hundreds of thousands of spectators watched as, as some 50,000 people, mainly comprising of troops, as well, of course, as the monarch herself, paraded through London over the course of two and a half hours. The procession was headed by mounted British troops. The colonial escort, as it was described in the official programme, came after the carriages carrying foreign envoys and representatives, and pride of place within this colonial escort was given to the 11 colonial premiers the focus of Chamberlain's charm offensive, who were accompanied by mounted soldiers from their respective colonies in Canada, Australia, New Zealand and South Africa. Near the rear of the escort, behind other mounted troops from various colonies, came two bodies of colonial infantry. Now, the whole event was widely covered in the press. There's a lot of kind of um, free supplements for newspapers, collectors, cards, there's a whole paraphernalia um, that, that's produced around this moment. And in such coverage, the presence of the colonial infantry often drew comment. The Illustrated London News wrote of a motley array of infantry, terrible and yet beautiful to behold. Sikhs, Chinese from Hong Kong, Malays from Singapore, Dayaks, Sinhalese, Houses, West India regiments, Negroes from British Guyana and dusky warriors from Trinidad. In the Daily Mail, G.W. Stevens wrote as follows. Up they came, more and more, new types, new realms at every couple of yards, an anthropological museum, a living gazetteer of the British Empire. With them came their English officers, who they obey and follow like children. And you began to understand as never before what the empire amounts to. Not only that we possess all these remote outlandish places and can bring men from every um, end of the earth to join us in honouring our Queen, but also that all these people are working not simply, simply under us, 
but with us. That we send out a boy here and a boy there, and the boy takes hold of the savages of that party comes to and teaches them to march and shoot as he tells them to obey him and believe in him and die for him and the queen. The sentiments expressed by Stevens are perhaps the clearest window into late Victorian ideas about race and empire, which were at their absolute fore in, in, in the pinnacle of the diamond during the Diamond Jubilee. We see a kind of strict racial hierarchy, albeit one softened by the, the metaphor of family. We see the idea of the military itself as a model for empire and for imperial rule over what Stevens called savages. And we also see the use of that kind of anthropological museum metaphor such that every color, every constant, every race, every speech was displayed and ordered through the military procession itself. Now, as the Illustrated London News had noted, the West India Regiment was deemed part of this motley array, motley array even though it was a regular part of the British Army. 12 men and non-commissioned officers representing both battalions, uh, representing both battalions at the Diamond Jubilee, including uh, this man here, Sergeant William Gordon, uh, they were led by Lieutenant Colonel George Madden, commander of the 1st Battalion, and as well as marching in the main procession on the 22nd of June, the soldiers also participated in a large military review at Aldershot on the 1st of July and joined other colonial troops in visiting Windsor Castle the following day. As with other uh, mainly non-white troops, they were often subject to a kind of um, an ethnographic eye uh, during the Diamond Jubilee, and also we get accounts of how um, um, while they were quartered at Chelsea Barracks, they were the subject of much, uh, the objects of much public interest, like people coming up to sort of see them and, and find out about them. Um, and Gordon, uh, who was singled out for being the only coloured soldier in Her Majesty's service who has the Victoria Cross, often featured prominently. And amid the kind of array of military types from across the British Empire present at the Diamond Jubilee, the West India Regiment found itself classified as another colonial unit. And again, you see often this kind of material, this kind of almost like semi-anthropological kind of categorization of um, the soldiers and the West India regiments and other um, non-white uh, forces, especially. Um, now, this is not to say that military distinctions went unacknowledged. So for example, the Illustrated London News sought to ensure that the quote, excellent Negro troops of the West India regiment would not be confused with merely local bodies of armed police from Trinidad and Guyana. And of course, the fact that they had to clarify that was, as I mentioned a few times before, itself a, a manifestation of contemporary public understanding, a misunderstanding rather. But in the procession on the 22nd of June, as with during the Sons of the Empire pageant, which can be seen as a kind of trial run, um, the West India Regiment was placed among the motley array of colonial infantry rather than with the rest of the British Army. And this was also echoed in contemporary accounts uh, so press coverage often drew a distinction between British bred colonials on the one hand, Canadians, Australians, etc., who were testimony to the greatness of the British race, and then native colonial troops on the other, including the fine fighting West India Regiment. So we see a kind of a, a racial logic becoming coming to, to the fore in the way in which they're talked about and described. Such racialized logics and the kind of um, sensitivities that could accompany them were also evident elsewhere during the Diamond Jubilee. At the Aldershot Review on the 1st of July, the West India Regiment soldiers again paraded alongside other representatives of colonial units separate from the British, um, from British metropolitan units. However, perhaps because of the military setting, they were given pride of place at the front of the colonial infantry forces. And in so doing, they marched ahead of white colonial soldiers, including those of the West Australia First Infantry Volunteers. And the press reported the unhappiness at this sequencing and describing this as a national slight, which ignored Australian sensitivities around race. It was claimed that this insult was also fed more, felt more widely amongst other uh, white units who were parading behind the West India Regiment. Whether such reports reflected a genuine sense of grievance or not, they certainly articulated the view held by some that the West India Regiment's personnel should be kept in their place within the racial imperial hierarchy. Let me draw some conclusions. The West Australia First Infantry volunteers, who were so supposedly so incensed because they'd had to march behind the West India Regiment soldiers, also featured in the graphics print of our colonial troops with which I started. 
published the year after the Diamond Jubilee, a striking feature of the image is the conspicuous presence of this West India soldier who stands in the crowd, uh, at the middle of the crowd. The white of the shirt and the yellow gold trim on the jacket serves to make the figure stand out from the scarlets and dark blues that characterize most of the other infantry, something enhanced, of course, by the Zouave uniform and headwear, whilst cavalry and other troops to the rear are a rather less distinct presence. The result is to make the West India Regiment a rather unique figure in this scene, something that's reinforced by his immediate setting. To the man's immediate rear stand men from the Hong Kong European Police, the Sierra Leone Frontier Force, and the Royal Malta Engineers. Uh, engineers, their dark blue uniform serving to accentuate his. While two Canadian soldiers from the Governor General's Foot Guards and the Toronto Royal Grenadiers flank him on either side, their similar attire serving as a kind of frame. Meanwhile, a corporal from the Trinidad Light Infantry sits at his feet. The central and prominent place of the West India Regiment soldier may have been no more than an artistic choice given the unusual nature of the Zouave uniform, although there are other Zouave uniforms in this image and those people aren't, are, are right at the edges. But actually, you, you see, if you look at similar prints to this, West India regiments often are in the middle, which is kind of interesting. I think it also serves to illustrate how the West India regiment was a kind of prominent feature in late Victorian practices of military display and pageantry, and often served as kind of focal point for questions, for discussions about race, empire, and military service. Indeed, I argue that the coverage of the West India regiments up to and beyond the 1897 Diamond Jubilee turned on this kind of uncertainty about their place in the British Empire and its global military forces. This was there from the very beginning when there were intense disputes about their creation and service. But this sense was reinforced in 1897 by the kind of sheer weight, ideological weight the Diamond Jubilee carried. To put it another way, this supreme moment of Britannic nationalism, as it being put it, served to clarify the place of the West India regiments, not only in the amongst the kind of military elites, but also in a kind of wider public imagination in that they didn't really belong in. They didn't really count as part of the British army. Indeed, despite the efforts of Ellis and others, the increased public attention that West India regiment forces received at this period, this did not secure their place within the British imperial imagination. And this came down to more than public ignorance, though this did not help. Rather, their symbolic removal from the ranks of the British Army so that they were cast as part, albeit a prominent part, of our colonial troops was the result of their long-standing symbolic and military marginalisation. Almost 30 years after the Diamond Jubilee, 20,000 people watched the final trooping of the colour by the West India Regiment at Up Park Camp in Jamaica in a ceremony that was described as impressive and full of pathos. The regiment was being disbanded. Lieutenant Colonel W. Miller, its most recent commander, requested that the regimental colours be presented to George V and deposited at Windsor Castle. The War Office agreed, but it refused to pay the return, uh, the, the, the travel fares of any soldiers returning from Britain to the Caribbean. In consequence, no African Caribbean personnel could accompany the colours, which were instead taken by seven white British officers and warrant officers who were returning home. Most went straight on leave, leaving Miller with little time to put together a reasonably sized party of men who had only very, some quite loose connections to the West India Regiment to attend the palace. The presentational party was received at Buckingham Palace with no ceremony other than brief thanks from George V who acknowledged the fine record of gallantry under the most arduous conditions. And the scene was poignant, not for what occurred at Buckingham Palace, the whole thing took less than 20 minutes, but for how little ceremony there was, and also because, of course, who was not there. Of the men who made up the regiment and whose predecessors had been responsible for Dominica, Guadeloupe, Sierra Leone, etc., and indeed of the splendid uniform that they'd been wearing since 1858, there was no sign. And I think that's an appropriate place to leave this discussion of what it means when the West India Regiment went home. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that, David. Uh, I'm just going to stop the recording now, everyone, and we can take uh, some questions from the audience.